I invite you to pull out your Bibles, uh, if you've brought them with, or one of the few Bibles, as we turn to our second reading for this morning, uh, continuing in our journey through the Gospel of John, picking up in chapter 13, 1 through 17. So again, that's John 13, 1 through 17. Here is God's word to us. Before the festival of Passover, Jesus knew that his time had come to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them fully. Jesus and his disciples were sharing the evening meal. The devil had already provoked Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew the Father had given everything into his hands, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robes. Picking up a linen towel, he tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into the wash basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that he was wearing. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You don't understand what I'm doing now, but you will understand later. No, Peter said, you will never wash my feet. Jesus replied, Unless I wash you, you won't have a place with me. Simon Peter said, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus responded, Those who have bathed need only to have their feet washed, because they are completely clean. You disciples are clean, but not every one of you. He knew who would betray him. That's why he said, Not every one of you is clean. After he washed the disciples' feet, he put on his robes, and returned to his place at the table. He said to them, Do you know what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you speak correctly, because I am. If I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you too must wash each other's feet. I've given you as an example, just as I have done. You must also do. I assure you, servants aren't greater than their master, nor are those who are sent greater than the one who sent them. Since you know these things, you will be happy if you do them. The story continues, but this ends our reading for this morning. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Uh, please pray with me. Loving God, we come to you this Lent, and life is swirling around us. At times we feel vulnerable and exposed. We feel as though we're still covered in ash and, and weighed down by the darkness of the season. The weight feels as heavy as snow on our shovels this morning. So help us offer these burdens to you. Renew us, refresh us, as we meet you again in this sacred story, in this place, in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 120 grubby, dirty toes. Right, this is the last scene before Jesus is stabbed by, in the back by one of his friends, and then put on trial, and then crucified. And since he's about to be executed, we might think that Jesus would do, do something grand or strategic. Right, something impressive, a follow-up miracle. A new sign, a bucket list trip. But instead, he picks up a towel and he washes the toes, knowing full well that, that ten of these dusty toes are going to carry Peter, denial after denial after denial. He washes them anyway, knowing that another 100 of these toes is going to scatter, right, and hide all of his disciples. He washes them anyway, knowing full well that ten of these toes would carry Judas, who's going to sell him out. He washes them anyway, a hundred and twenty dusty toes, washed and dried, and welcomed to the table. And of course, I think one of the most powerful parts of this story is that he kneels down before Judas. All right, we've known that Judas was shady from the very beginning of this story. His last name in this gospel from the moment that he showed up is, 
is Judas the one who would betray Jesus? That's how he's introduced. That's how we know him for the whole time. Judas, the so-called friend who's going to sell Jesus out to the religious leaders and to the soldiers. But Jesus still washes his feet. Jesus knows all of this. He knows Judas' deepest secrets and his plotting and his backstabbing. And he still takes off the robes and grabs a towel and washes Judas' feet. Now, I, I know that foot washing is a pretty foreign thing for us. Right? If we've seen it happen or if we've been a part of it, it's either because we attended a Monday Thursday service at some point in time where we had foot washing, or uh, because it was part of the Manny Petty package over at the Pebble Spa. <laughs> right? But for Jesus' friends and his disciples, washing your feet was, was par for the course, but in, in a lot of ways at least. Right? And even though I did see someone this last week walking past the holiday station in a t-shirt, uh, it's still warmer in Jerusalem than it is here now. And they wore sandals more often than we do especially right now. They also walked a lot more than we do, and they had dirty roads instead of paved concrete. They also had animals instead of cars. So getting from one place to another uh, was a little bit like walking in, in a street or in a parade on streets that were made of dust with no one to pick up after the horses in front of you. So what I'm saying is that there were things to wash off your feet when you got where you were going. Right? And part of Lent is that. It's admitting that, that we have things that we would like washed off too. Every single one of us has been on a journey where we've spent time wading through things that we wish we didn't have to. And those experiences are still clinging to us. We're still carrying them with us. Times when we were not our best self. Most of us try to hide them, and we do that most successfully, I think, on a Sunday morning. We clean up pretty well and put on a show, but we still walk around with dust on our feet. Right? In church, especially during Lent, we, we talk about being sinful. Right? We create a space in every single worship service to name the places where life has just gotten messy, right? where the world has fallen apart, and, and where we have. <laughs> But with our story today, with Jesus washing the feet of his disciples, I, I think we also need to talk about what it looks like, especially in the Bible, uh, to be unclean. Because so often the world that we see the world around us as, as black or white or good or evil, right? But not everything that is wrong with, with us or our world is a sin. Certainly not as the Bible tells it. Right? We do hear about right and wrong and morality and immorality, and we should. But what's wrong goes deeper than that. We feel shame and self-hatred and false guilt, and we feel unclean. Right? But in the world of Jesus, the roads were long and dirty, and that's why a good host, or maybe even a mediocre host, would give you some water to wash up when you got there. Now, in the Hebrew Bible, the first, the Old Testament, uh, God does the same thing. But in the old days of Israel, being unclean didn't mean that you were guilty of doing something wrong. You could be born with something like a skin disease. Maybe you helped out with a funeral. Maybe you gave birth and brought new life into the world. All of it meant that you were ritually unclean, but that wasn't always a bad thing. It's not sinful or immoral. It's unclean. Even Jesus makes himself ritually impure, it says, right? He touches lepers and a hemorrhaging woman and a corpse at different points. But it's not the end. From the earliest days, the rituals, or there were rituals to wash away the past and the messiness of life, rituals to welcome everyone to the table with a kind of fresh start. Even though most of us don't spend much time with purity laws in the books of Leviticus, Right? We still live in a world that's filled with decay and dusty roads. We have pavement and cars, but, but every one of us has been through something where we've spent time wading through those things we wish that we didn't have to. We live in a world where things can and do go wrong, and it clings to us. But what I want you to hear in this story is that Jesus meets us where we are. And he doesn't say, clean yourself up and then come to me. 
He doesn't say, once you've overcome your struggles, I'll accept you. He says, come to me, even if you feel ashamed, even if someone told you you should, even if you've been abused, or you're confused, or you're afraid, or you have a lot more questions about, about Jesus than answers. He says, come, and I will give you peace. What defines you, we learn in this story, is not the things that you've been through, or what you've suffered, or the disease you're fighting, or the things you feel. What defines you is the God who holds you, who bends down and washes feet. Right? The God who says, I love you, who also says, now I don't see a speck of dirt on you, and I wouldn't change a single thing about you. You are a reflection of my own heart, flesh and blood. Nothing changes Jesus' devotion to us. He says, you are mine, and I am yours, now and forever. Your place, it's at the table. Yes, with the fickle and bickering and frail disciples, but also the table where children laugh and feast and where we all bask in the glow of God's smiling face, who says, I love you. So go and share that love with others. Amen. I invite you now to reflect on the word as it's been spoken and as it hits each one of you today.